Good morning and Happy New Year, everyone. Tim Nyland here. Today is Wednesday, January 13th, and this is our weekly strategy call for Zach's Professional Services. Each week, we focus in on what's moving the market, interesting trends, and investing opportunities. If you have a topic you'd like me to explore in a future video, please leave a comment below. You can check out previous strategy calls on our channel, and you'll also find many more videos on investing and making the most of Zach's Pro platforms. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button below to make sure you never miss any of our future calls. Today, we're gonna to resume our hyper growth strategy series that we started on December 2nd. And specifically, we're gonna continue our semiconductor discussion from last week and look at the framework I use for identifying Apple acquisition targets or any acquisition target for that matter. In the spirit of full disclosure, I do maintain a small position in the Apple acquisition candidate we are going to discuss today. I would like to remind everyone that hyper growth investing is very speculative in nature and is not suitable for, our, for all investors. I'm not here to pitch any security as a buy or sell, rather I'm simply here to identify analytical issues of relevance you should consider and from here you'll need to draw your own conclusions regarding any buy or sell decisions. So let's go ahead and get started. Just a quick recap from two weeks ago. Uh, again, I like to think of the chip industry as consisting of of two types of designers and manufacturers. We've got the special purpose examples. These are gonna be your, your modem field programmable chip players and, and RF or radio frequency players. And some of these special purpose companies would be the likes of Qualcomm, Xilinx, Corvo, and I actually added Skyworks in here and you'll see why in just a minute. Uh, some of the more general purpose examples are gonna be your CPUs, your GPUs, and your ARM processors. And again, sample open architecture players, your large ones, AMD, NVIDIA, Intel, and ARM. And then the sample vertically integrated players, Amazon, Apple, Google, and Microsoft. And again, from two weeks ago, this is literally the tail wagging the dog. It's these four companies that are literally driving uh, the innovation in the chip space at this point. So again, I wanna remind everyone that the semiconductor landscape is one of the fastest moving, most competitive industries in existence today and there are massive acquisitions always underway in this space. So we're gonna take a look at a framework that I like to use. Amazon, Apple, Google, and now Microsoft are pushing further into vertically marrying their own chip design. Again, we spoke about this two weeks ago with their own software to squeeze even more operating and cost efficiencies. And this is obviously leading to many, many acquisitions. Some of the more prevalent ones in 2020 or predominant, I should say, in 2020 would be AMD's acquisition of Xilinx. And you'll see up here under field programmable, Xilinx is, is definitely the leader in field programmable chips. You'll see this FPGA technology. Um, this technology is, is, is the up and coming um, technology for the more customized sample open architecture players. So AMD now entering this space with the acquisition of Xilinx. These are field programmable gate array chips. And if you think about your, your standard general purpose CPU processors, those processors tend to be very efficient at doing many, many multiple tasks at once. And when AMD now is introducing this FPGA technology into their CPUs, it's giving um, the, the chip itself more customizable set of instructions um, to execute a specific task much more quickly than a traditional CPU processor. So now AMD is moving into the more customized CPU uh, arena, if you will, and that's going to ultimately open up another uh, vertical here in, in the general purpose. So we'll have a sample open architecture, we'll have a vertically integrated player, and then we're gonna have you know semi-customizable GPUs and CPUs. This is, this is coming and this field programmable gate array uh, technology is, is huge. And that's why Lisa Su uh, acquired uh, Xilinx. Very, very important to understand that if you don't understand what, what field programmable gate array technology is, please look it up. The next big one uh, was obviously NVIDIA's acquisition or at least the announcement of them intending to acquire ARM. This is gonna have to go through several layers of um, of, of, of due diligence, and there's gonna be obviously several countries involved, most likely the UK and China, uh, and perhaps even the United States. So um, this is a, a huge acquisition. Um, the ARM technology obviously 
uh, being your leading technology for all of your wearable devices and, and cell phones. These are the low draw, low heat uh, processors that are used in those devices. And this was an acquisition that NVIDIA made um, uh, of ARM out of the UK, and it was uh, a, a being acquired by SoftBank. The next one is not necessarily an acquisition. You'll see that I actually have that asterisk here to kind of explain it. But it's important to understand the implications um, when Apple formally put Qualcomm on notice. Uh, and this was done in uh, late 2020 in favor of Apple's in-house designed vertically integrated modems. And again, this resulted out of uh, many years of litigation between Apple and Qualcomm over the switching technology in the modems. So essentially, any device that connects to a cell tower, when it switches between 3G, 4G, 4G, 5G, um, the ability for that call to stay connected, and not get dropped, is Qualcomm's technology. They have a patent on it, and Apple has to license it. When Apple lost that litigation, the first thing they did is they turned around and bought the technology from Intel's team. They acquired, they acquired the entire modem technology team in 2019 and turned around and signed a six-year agreement with Qualcomm, ultimately with the intent of sunsetting that Qualcomm technology. They just announced their intent officially during the fourth quarter of last year, and they put Qualcomm on notice, during which time the likes of Corvo and Skyworks, uh, those stocks took a very large hit alongside Qualcomm, of course. Um, this is one of the first signs you look for when trying to identify a potential acquisition candidates. When you see that type of a shot across the bow, uh, take a look at other suppliers within the vertical to see who's being impacted. That will give you your first clue as to where the buy side might be looking next for acquisition candidates. And that brings us to Corvo and Skyworks, okay? So we'll talk a lot more about Corvo and Skyworks in a minute, but in order to understand what's going on at Apple, we have to see what Tim Cook is really cooking up. And I don't know exactly what Tim Cook is cooking up, but I do know a few things. And in looking at the Zach's research chart of research and development as a percent of sales, I can see that R&D as a percent of sales is again approaching its 20 year highs, not seen since the iPod and iPhone birth time period. So if we look back here, you can see that R&D as a percent of revenues is about 8%. And you can see they rode that iPod, iPhone wave all the way down to 2012, and it's just been literally ramped up ever since. Now, I want everybody to think about the magnitude of this percentage change uh, in sales, specifically between 2003 and where we're at now. And the fact that R&D is making up about 6.83% of that is absolutely startling. Um, when you consider how sales have grown from 2003 to 2020 at Apple. So Tim Cook is cooking up something we don't know what, okay? Every single day I open up the Wall Street Journal, I read the weekend edition, whatever you read, you will see something about 5G. And when you think 5G, I want you to think RF filter chips. And when you think RF filter chips, I want you to think Corvo and Skyworks. And again, when we start looking at Apple's R&D as a percent of sales approaching its 20-year high, at the same time, demand for these RF filter chips is surging across the board. Specifically in this Wall Street Journal article, it cites that the recent bids for the 5G frequencies have even blown away Wall Street's, and I'm quoting this, highest forecast. Um, the companies are literally fighting over these most valuable wireless rights, it says. The idea here is this is all radio frequencies. This is all Corvo and Skyworks. And if you take a look at the price and earnings chart again out of the Zach's research system for Corvo and Skyworks, you'll see that these companies have bounced off their lows post COVID and have just absolutely skyrocketed. And that's because during this COVID crash is when Trump basically signed in, the administration signed in um, the use of 5G in the United States. And so this has just been on a tear ever since. And Corvo is obviously one of the original stocks that I had outlined in, in my 5G um, um, thematic portfolio back in the spring as well. Same thing with Skyworks. So again, 
two best of breed players in the RF chip space. Again, um, the the ten year, or I should say, this one's more like a twenty year price earnings chart out of the Zach's Research System. Extremely stable company, um, rock solid performer, one of the leaders uh, in the in the RF filter chip space. So the idea here that we have to get our arms around is that every single hardware product that Apple produces literally relies on RF filter chips in some capacity, right? So this is the largest opportunity for vertical integration behind the CPU ARM chips, and, and Apple's already announced this, right? So Apple's already vertically integrating. Um, they've already taken the shot across the bow and given Qualcomm the warning. Um, they're going to start using their own modem chips. I would look for this, um, obviously, sometime before that six-year uh, agreement is up between Apple and Qualcomm. That would put us at 2025. Um, you know, the most likely uh, place for them to start would be in in some more of the wearables before they try to, you know, in a, in a, in, integrate the the new modem technology in the, in the phones, which would be the more risky bet. So just just kind of thinking outside the box how this stuff normally works. Um, Apple has a massive reliance and exposure to these RF suppliers from Corvo and Skyworks, and I'm going to show you that right now. So again, Corvo and Skyworks, radio frequency chip solutions, total, massive total addressable market and growing, right? So this is all across defense, aerospace, mobile products, all your network infrastructure. This also includes 5G, 4G. Uh, including networks all around the world that are still developing, right? Latin America, Africa, um, Southeast Asia, cable television, Wi-Fi connectivity, including the new Wi-Fi 6 technology, all the automotive um, use cases. Now the cars are connecting to your home internet while they're parked in the garage. I mean, you name it, it's happening, right? Wireless infrastructure and more. Um, Corvo derives 33% of its revenues from Apple. Skyworks derives 50% of its revenues from Apple. Okay, so if Apple is going to mitigate some of this risk in the RF chips space, you know, what's the likelihood of them buying Corvo and Skyworks? And, and will Apple be willing to pay a multiple on its own revenues? And the answer is that is probably not, right? So if Apple is going to be interested in expanding its vertical into RF chips, they're going to be more interested in buying the intellectual property versus buying the growth in the actual chip space. And Apple has a long term track record of buying the strategic IP. Um, the last time we saw it was obviously the modem technology from Intel in, in 2019 to ultimately combat Qualcomm's uh, dominance in that space. So what I want to do is I want to take this framework one step further and give you an example of a company that that would potentially have what Apple is looking for. And we're going to discuss, you know, the steps that I took to kind of, you know, derive and back into this company. And so the name of the company is Acoustis Technology, ticker symbol AKTS. And the one thing I want you to see is that it's definitely a development stage company, right? We're losing money. 2021's a loss. 2022's a loss, albeit smaller. And then what I want everybody to notice is in 2023, we skyrocket to a massive profit to the tune of 807% growth. And, and this is what you look for uh, when you're looking for hyper growth type companies. This is that example of operating leverage where you get revenue growth and then you get that compounding effect on earnings once all the technology and the infrastructure is in place and Acoustis moves from development into full production. Okay, so you can see that here in the numbers. During my spring 2020 5G webinar, I mentioned that Acoustis was one to watch. They're now entering full production phase and landing contracts, right? So this is a development stage RF filter chip stocks, and they have basically two technological advances, right? So their chips are extremely small, and they have excellent thermal performance, which makes the chips last longer. Uh, they don't get as hot. The chips are basically designed for 4G, 5G, Wi-Fi, that's the new Wi-Fi 6, as well as use in uh, network infrastructure and defense systems. And in December of 2020, Acoustis announced its first 5G mobile order from a Tier 1 RF solutions provider. And that same month, Acoustis announced its second and third customers for Wi-Fi 6 filter chips, right? Currently, the Zacks rank is a hold, and we're going to go through that here in just a few minutes, but I did want to mention that. It's very important. The Zacks rank and the Zacks research is part of the process. Revenue growth is forecast to explode quarter over quarter. I should say quarterly year over year, excuse me, um, as the company moves from development stage to production. You can see the forecast estimates in here, right? We were just bumbling along, and then all of a sudden, we just take off. And... Um, 
that this is basically leading to a forward four quarter estimate of revenue growth in excess of 900%. Okay, this is the growth and margin view out of the Zach's research system. And again, we're going to be bringing all of these views into the advisor tools platform shortly. Um, we have projects underway right now in, our, in the planning phase for all of that, just to let everyone know. Um, so there's been obviously large capital investments that have been made over the last five years of this company. And when you look at the key stats at the bottom of the price and earnings chart out of the Zach's research system, you can see that they've actually been good stewards of capital. Um, they've got relatively low float shares outstanding. And um, in the event of any sort of short squeeze or, or good news to come, it, it tends to lead to a pretty solid price response. Um, doing the analysis on the balance sheet, they've got some long-term debt. Um, that was taken on to cover cash flow requirements through to production. They may need a secondary to fund additional cash flow requirements. I think a lot of that is just going to depend upon what kind of contracts they're able to bring in here in 2021. Um, operating leverage is poised to deliver 800% EPS growth by, by 2023. I warn everybody about this FY3 number uh, when I've been on strategy calls. If you've ever done a strategy call with me and we've analyzed stocks, you'll know that. And um, in particular, this one is of, of, of one to note because there's really only one analyst uh, making an estimate on this, right? So I did the due diligence and this is a real estimate. It is a major Wall Street firm and um, that number is real. The other thing that you wanna do is you wanna dig into the management team. This is something that obviously Apple will be acquiring. They're not only acquiring the company, they're really acquiring the intellectual property, right? And so the idea is if they're looking to reduce their reliance on Corbo and Skyworks, they're going to be looking for experience amongst the management team. The Acoustis founder and CEO is a 13-year 13, 13 Corbo veteran who is VP and general manager. And I've got their bios here, and I've got those sections highlighted, or I should say circled in red so you can see that. Uh, I'll go through a few more of them. It's extremely impressive. And this is what you want to look for as part of that framework when determining uh, the likelihood of an acquisition candidate. Right, Apple actively looking for somebody like this to the extent they are, they're going to be looking to this management team and looking at their qualifications. The Acoustis EVP of business development is also a Corvo veteran. The Acoustis chief product officer is a 29 year veteran of both Corvo and Skyworks, super impressive. Okay, Acoustis vice president of operation is also a veteran of Corvo. So if I were in Tim Cook's shoes, um, I, I mean, I obviously like what I see. Acoustis Vice President of Global Sales and Vice President of Quality, also Corvo Veterans. Okay. So when you're looking at that 5G watch list, and this is the same exact 5G watch list I presented in my 5G webinar back in the spring of 2020, um, you click on the Zach's Research tab and you'll get access to all of our research that's available. And I wanted to take this moment as an opportunity to discuss really the breadth and depth of the Zach's research itself. So when you look at the report column, this is your analyst written research coverage. And you'll see that there are a few gaps in here amongst this 5G and mobility watch list that I have up on the screen. And obviously this is by design because these reports are analyst written and our research coverage is roughly 1,000 stocks. And so where we really get a feather in our cap is the fact that uh, because our research is more quantitatively based, we're able to have a much larger universe than those that are more fundamentally based, which is the bulk of the bulge bracket on Wall Street. We actually have what we call our snapshot, snapshot research coverage that's in, in excess of roughly 3,100 stocks. And you can see that even though we do not have an analyst written research report for Acoustis Technology, we actually do have a one-page computer-generated snapshot with all of the Zach's rank information uh, contained in it. So you'll still get access to that award-winning Zach's rank, um, albeit you don't have an analyst-written research uh, report to look at, but at least you've got um, something rather than nothing. So the Zach's research um, right now showing a Zach's rank of hold. And this is an example of what those one-page um, computer-generated snapshot research reports look like. They're very, very clean. They're very, very good. Um, you can see the number of analysts up, revisions down, total number. When you look at the Zach's rank, I want you to think of estimate, revision agreement, revision magnitude, upside potential, and estimate surprise, okay? Quantitatively, those are the factors 
that we are incorporating into the Zach's ring. And when it comes to the actual analyst written research itself, those roughly 1,000 stocks that we actually have a team of analysts um, working on the direction of Shiraz Mian, who's a former Goldman Sachs oil and gas analyst, um, we actually write the analyst written research in accordance to the Zach's rank. The analysts do have the ability to override the Zach's rank quantitatively, but it's very, very rare and there has to be specific reason. And I have not seen it yet to date. I know it's been done before, but I have not actually seen it myself. So when we look at the definitions of the Zach's rank, I'm not gonna go through and read these. You can request a copy of my slide deck. Um, you'll see the email addresses at the end. Um, very, very easy, the agreement, the magnitude, upside potential, and estimate surprise. Go ahead and request the deck if you want these definitions. Be happy to email it over to you. And then obviously the use of the Zach's rank for stocks. Um, optimal time horizon for Zach's rank, one to six months. Uh, th there, there's so many uses for Zach's rank. If, if you've got questions, specific use cases, um, feel free to shoot us an email. Um, shoot me an email. More than happy to discuss it. Uh, I get a lot of questions related to Zach's rank and the earnings certain portfolio themselves. And um, you'll see here that it says, consequently, many institutional investors use the model as a timing tool rather than a method of picking long-term outperformers. I mean, obviously, the idea behind the earnings certain portfolio is that you know, we like to take a look at a, you know, a five to 10 plus year time horizon. So um, I really don't use the Zach's rank in the management of the earnings certain portfolios, but there are excellent use cases uh, for the Zach's rank and more than happy to discuss those with anyone who wants to dig into it a little bit deeper. Um, go ahead and give us a call or send us an email. The, the Zach's research is, is excellent. It's unbiased, independent research. And I have a, a slide up here now on the screen that, that shows exactly why it's so good. And um, this is very important to our founder, Len Zacks. Um, when we took a look and did an actual research study of the average distribution of broker recommendations across Wall Street, this is obviously from 1231 of 99 to the end of 2018, you'll see that we had 65% bullish and only 4% bearish. And again, it, this is for a multitude of reasons, um, investment banking relationships, you name it. There's obviously a lot of different reasons that can influence this. But being how Zach's is completely independent, unbiased, we have no investment banking relationships out there. Um, the distribution of the Zach's rank is extremely conservative um, and it's solid and our performance reflects that. So we get a full 20% bearish, we get a full 20% bullish and you get a full 60% that are hold. Okay. So in short, um, when looking at this framework, it's a very simple framework to follow. It's it's very, very intuitive. It's very easy to follow. Um, again, given the R&D spend increase at Apple and their reliance on this RF technology, Corbo and Skyworks, for virtually all of its products, and this is at the same time that, that everyone else is looking to Corbo and Skyworks for this RF technology as well, you know, what's the next vertical integration move for Apple? I mean, we obviously don't know who the next acquisition candidate is going to be. But this is the type of framework I use for Apple and all other companies when I'm trying to determine the direction of the acquisition target. So rewatch the video again and think about this from a macro perspective, right? You're, you're starting top down. Um, you're getting some kind of announcement. You're seeing some massive negative price response across the board from, from a vertical. And then you start looking at what is the next move for these companies. This is what we just did for Apple. Um, and you can do it really for any company. So some additional disclosures as of the date of this strategy webinar, I do maintain long positions in AMD, NVIDIA, Acoustis, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, and Apple. And I do not have any exposure to Xilinx, Intel, Corvo, or Qualcomm. Um, that's about it for this week. If you found this video helpful, please hit the like button below and be sure to subscribe for future videos. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you next Wednesday for another weekly strategy call. Feel free to follow me on LinkedIn, at Twitter, also our company pages, LinkedIn, Zax-Professional-Services, and on Twitter at ZA Tools. Any questions, comments, or requests for the PowerPoint, please email me directly or email advisortools at zax.com or zrs at zax.com. Thank you, and we'll talk to you next week.